The human image has always had an immense pull on me. I firmly believe that it is the highest calling of visual art making. A painting succeeds or fails on the issue of whether or not it is an emotionally satisfying or charged experience for the viewer. There are many modes of drawing, high realism, expressionism, abstraction, etc. But they must all meet that singular criteria. This singular criteria is comprised of three qualities. The first quality is called the visually impressive. This is the craft of drawing and where the issue of plausibility must be met. The second quality is the emotive or spiritually impressive. To have a finely drawn image that is devoid of any emotion or spirit is of course dead. Conversely, unconstrained emotion without disciplined skill actually results in timid and ineffectual work no matter how heated the emotions were at the time of its creation. Third, and of critical importance, is the construct. That is the language of visual art making. Drawing is a language of symbols. No matter how convincing a portrait drawing is, it is still inert material on a piece of paper. It is the magical process of drawing, the struggles with proportion line and tone that breathe life and spirit onto the pictorial surface. The primary focus in this course is the learning of the craft of portrait drawing. I will be introducing you to quite a few concepts, some of which you may never have encountered before. begin to draw, there are a couple of issues that first must be taken care of. First, and of critical importance, is our station point. The station point is the easel, your tabouret, your drawing materials, placement of the model. As far as the drawing board is concerned, we want to be sure the drawing, the paper or pictorial surface, is just slightly below our eye level perhaps one or two degrees. We don't want to be drawing down at our belly, nor do we want to be drawing up high, nor do we want the paper flat, as that brings in problems of parallax, and hence distortion. Also in terms of setting up our model, we want to be sure we can see both our pictorial surface, i.e. the paper, and our model, Sonia, simultaneously. We don't want to be playing peekaboo with a model. That will not help. Critical to portrait drawing is a sound understanding of the skull. The muscles and fatty tissues of the human head are relatively thin and, unlike the leg, arm, or abdomen, are distinctly formed by the underlying structures of the skull. The arabesque of the skull is not round. It is rectangular in to shape. To begin the eye, the medial and outer or lateral canthi must be placed. I'll discuss how to do this in a few minutes. The eye is very seldom perfectly horizontal. It either slopes upwards or downwards from the medial canthus. The degree of slope varies from individual to individual. Sonia's eyes slope upwards. The arabesque of the eye's opening is struck. Try to avoid having a wide-eyed look. The relaxed eye is open only about two-thirds to half of what one would normally draw. 
Note the cul-de-sac of the medial canthus. Our symbolic preconception of the eye is that of a two-dimensional football. Instead, think of the eye as being like a hard-boiled egg. It is a three-dimensional orb recessed into the eye socket. The medial upper eyelid is slightly higher, while the outer third of the lower eyelid is slightly lower. These two are diametrically opposed. The upper and lower eyelids wrap around the eyeball. The eyelids consist of the thin orbicularis oculi palpebral portion which lie over the semi-rigid tarsal plates within each eyelid. The upper eyelid is opened and closed by the levator palpebri superioris, a muscle within the eye socket. The upper eyelid forms a distinct crease. Take careful note of this crease and render it with architectonic straight lines. It is not a florid arc. That is another symbolic preconception. For reference purposes, I've roughly sketched in the eyebrow and the eye socket. I've also included the base of the nausea. Within the medial canthus is the pink corincula and the third eyelid, an evolutionary trace, the plica semilunaris. The color disc is the iris. Like the lens of a camera, it functions as an aperture controlling the amount of light entering the eye by dilating and constricting the pupil. The iris is concave, while the cornea, the clear contact lens-like covering, is convex. This has the effect of refracting the light entering the eye and lighting up the opposing side of the iris from the highlight. The radiating lines of the iris are colored folds, very much like a Japanese fan. The dark circumference of the iris is a result of small muscles that pull and relax the radiating folds of the iris, thus dilating and closing the pupil. The so-called white of the eye is the sclera, which is anything but white. It is a neutral gray, generally tinged with yellow, red, or blue. Keeping the sclera white lends a portrait of quality I call the village of the damned look. White eyes have no souls. Bearing in mind that the eyeball is a sphere, I've applied tone to the sclera and iris. Note how quickly the emotional resonance of this eye changes. The upper eyelid also affects a cast shadow upon the sclera and iris. I've further developed the eye with tone. The eyes are recessed within the eye sockets. Therefore, they will always be a little darker than the forehead or cheeks. It is the accents of light upon the eyelids and the glistening sclera that often mislead the beginning artist into thinking that the eyes are lighter than they are. And we're shaping the shadow on the LR a little better. With each drawing, I believe you should take each one right to the wall. I think as students you should not worry about overworking a drawing. Because inevitably what, inevitably what happens is one never goes beyond their current ability. They stop there and thus they don't grow, they don't progress. with a 2H. You can see the difference between here and here. Now we'll go back to here. Again, I'm only drawing the stroke in one direction. <laughs> 